Hey everyone, welcome. It is 1040 a.m. Eastern, 40 minutes past the top of the hour, wherever you are. So it's time for us to start our next session, which is Wilma Hodge's session on grading outside the box, creative approaches to alternative assessment in Sakai. So Wilma doesn't really need much of an introduction to most of you. Uh, we all know Wilma. Wilma is the Sakai community manager. She is director of e-learning initiatives at Longsite. Uh, she is one of the people with the most extensive knowledges of, uh, of the capabilities of Sakai that I know. And uh, she's also got this deep background in instruction, part of which is uh, based upon her doctorate in education that she, that she got some years back. So she's got a great background from which to talk about uh, the pedagogical implications of what goes on in Sakai. So let me turn this session over to Wilma. This is going to be pretty interesting. I'm looking forward to it. Wilma, take it away. Great. Thank you, Josh. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some different ways that you might want to um, set up courses in Sakai for, um, for alternative assessment. Um, so the first question you might be asking is why? <laughs> why do this? Um, and what is an al alternative assessment to what? What is it an alternative to? Um, so typically when we talk about alternative assessment, we talk about alternatives to your um, sort of traditional high stakes exams. Um, a lot of times, it's particularly in very large courses, high stakes exams are, um, compose a large part of the grade. And they often raise a lot of concerns about academic integrity, are students cheating? Um, you know, there's all sort of proctoring solutions to try to get around it. And, you know, there's there's no way around it. I mean, you can build a better mousetrap, but people still find ways if they're determined <laughs> enough. So, um, so one way to kind of get away from the pressure to perform well on a single exam that's the bulk of your grade, is to kind of um, use alternative approaches to assess people's learning in a different way. Um, and also, you know, a lot of this, um, a lot of times people would, would turn to more, um, you know, written uh, responses, papers, things like that. But now with chat GPT, uh oh, you know, how do you know your student actually wrote that? What if that's, you know, chat GPT taking your course and not, you know, so and so. Um, so it, it becomes even harder now with the technology at people's fingertips to determine if the student is actually doing the work if they are actually learning. Um, so there are some alternative assessment strategies that can help with that. Um, they do allow uh, typically students to demonstrate their knowledge more so than take a test where you have to just choose a you know radio button um, or submit a paper where, with the authorship um, potentially in question. Um, usually, alternative strategies will employ more personal, real time, you know, real real world scenarios. So it's more authentic for the user and they're more likely to be invested in it um, and engaged in you know doing the work because it's you know something of value that they um, they see and they can kind of relate to a little bit more. So, um, so that's kind of the, the premise as to why we would want to do some of this. Um, what I'm going to show you today, I'm going to look at three different things and how I've set them up in Sakai. So these are the three um, alternative methods that I'm going to look at today. And you may or may not be familiar with these, so I'll just do a quick, um, you know, recap of what they are. So specifications grading is the idea that the instructor um, constructs a, a list of specifications for all of the items that are due in the course. And everything's graded as a pass fail. There's no scaling of points. There's no, you know, um, numeric rubrics where, you know, you have, you know, like a 89.1 and you have people emailing you trying to get bumped up to a 90. Um, none of that. So everything's pass fail, although you might allow a multiple attempts on things. But the, the way the grade is constructed is that the assignments are bundled um, for students. So they know if they complete everything in bundle A, they get an A in the course, um, or everything in bundle B gets them a B. So you, you put together the list of requirements or specifications for each letter grade, 
and um, students can work toward those. And it gives them a little more agency in the process because they can see what's required and they can kind of you know, gear themselves to um, work toward a particular grade that they want to earn. Um, the also, also, there's the idea of tokens. Um, because everything's pass fail, um, you can sometimes use a token um, to trade in for a second chance on something or, uh, you know, a, a, a retake or, you know, a missed course, depending on what you're, you know, assigning points to. Um, so tokens are sometimes used. Um, so that's specifications grading in a nutshell. Um, the second um, alternative method is what's called ungrading. Um, and if you've not heard of this before, it sounded a little crazy to me at first too, but um, once I started thinking about it, it actually, I think, makes quite a lot of sense. And the idea with ungrading is that you don't have grades. Um, students are sort of conditioned, even as educators, we're conditioned to kind of scale things on a, you know, a point scale from one to a hundred and, you know, the letter grades and, and it's really very artificial if you start to think about it. Um, so it, what it does is it kind of removes that intrinsic motivation for students to actually learn the content uh, because all they're worried about is a number. Um, or a letter on a transcript. So the idea with ungrading is that you try to remove that grade pressure and you just focus on feedback. And a lot of times it's iterative assignments, things that go through multiple drafts throughout the semester. And the, the focus is really on improving and um, you know, working with the student to make them um, you know, apply their skills throughout the term. Um, and then at the end, oftentimes, because you still in an academic Academic system, there's still a registrar, they oftentimes require a final grade, so you have something on your transcript. Um, students might be asked to self-evaluate and give themselves grades at the end. Um, so they would provide a rationale and the instructor could decide whether or not they agree with it and tweak it before they put the actual score in there. But it, again, it takes the pressure off um, and allows students to kind of take ownership in their learning. Um, and then finally, um, the, the idea of oral exams. Now, this is not a new concept. Oral exams have been around forever. Um, in fact, a lot of you know thesis and dissertation defenses are, are a form of oral exam. Um, and I mean, it goes back to you know Socrates and Plato, I think. <laughs> but uh, we've moved away from that with all the technology and you know and people taking asynchronous courses and sometimes it's hard to to do that and it doesn't scale well realistically it doesn't scale well to very large courses it's hard to you know do an oral exam a kind of one-on-one -on -one with you know a thousand students in an intro course so there's a reason why they're used sparingly but i think for upper level courses and for courses that are very focused small group kind of things they can still be quite useful um, and so uh, in oral exams, their students are assessed, um, you know, by talking to them, you know, by having a conversation or an interview type format with the instructor. Um, and it's much harder to cheat, you know, I mean, you can't, you could read a, G a chat GPT transcript, I suppose, <laughs> but it's kind of hard when you're in a video call with someone to really, you know, be able to cheat the system in the traditional sense. Um, so instructors also have the opportunity to kind of dig a little deeper, you know, that if they don't quite um, understand where a student's going with a response, they can ask follow-up questions and kind of, you know, see if, does the student really get it? Do they really understand um, the concept that they're supposed to be taking away from it? So anyway, those are my three different methods to try to address some of those um, concerns about, you know, academic integrity and the use of unsanctioned technologies. Um, so, and just as an aside, uh, and these slides are available, I posted them in the conference site. If you wanna learn more about either specifications grading or ungrading, here's a couple of resources for you that you can um, check out to, to learn more about those. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move into a live demo, and I'm going to exit all my slides for a moment. Um, so just just as a this is that specs grading um, book. It's it's a quite quite an easy read um, if you're interested. And this is a blog by Jesse Stommel. These are the two resources that I that I uh, 
referenced. He has a really nice blog um, with a lot of uh, content about ungrading because that's something that he is uh, known for. So anyway, uh, just as if you have any light reading that you want to do later. Um, so I have here three courses. We're going to do them one at a time um, that I've set up in kind of keeping with each of these philosophies. So the first one is my specs grading course. And, um, and I've just got kind of a little blurb here on the, the dashboard when students log in to explain you know, how the, the course runs. But because this may be a little unusual to people, I'm also gonna um, do a little more uh, diligence. And I've, I've got here a lessons page where I've gone into more detail about how it works. So it just um, describes about the pass fail nature of the course, um, describes the tokens. And, um, and what I'm doing here is I've actually set up assignments to be the token because it's, um, it's easier for me to keep track if I have an assignment that I can go in and see that someone has submitted to use a token because the assignment tool will actually send you an email when there's a submission if you check that box. Um, so it's a, just kind of an easy way to track that kind of information. Um, and so students have the option to use or not. If they don't use any of their tokens, then they can skip the final exam. So that's kind of a reward for you know doing everything um, on time and not having any redos. But, um, but that's how the tokens work. So um, then I've got my course bundles explained. So I've set out here what my grade bundles are if people want to earn a particular grade in the course. Um, and I've kept it really simple for this demonstration site um, because you know the way I've set up my grade book is everything is zero or one, it's pass or fail. Um, so I wanted the scoring to also be pretty simple mathematically. So I've set it up. Um, I did use weighting because I wanted the final exam to be sort of a gatekeeper where you can't get higher than I think a, um, I think it's a, I forget. It's been a while since I set up the grade book. But anyway, you have, you have to take the final exam to, um, to get a, a, a B, I think, or higher. Um, you can't pass with some of these lower ones if you if you just skip the final. Um, so anyway, you have the opportunity to lose some points um, and still earn a decent grade, um, or you can trade in a token to redo something for a, a, a satisfactory score. So anyway, so that's how that works, and um, and I've used um, several tools in here. I've used assignments with um, different tools and here's my tokens. Those are also assignments. Um, I've used rubrics in here and the rubrics I've set up are just sort of, oops, let me go back to grade. That's where I want to go. I don't have any student work in here because this is really just a demo. But um, so if you want to see what the rubric looks like, it's basically just a pass fail zero or one rubric. But it makes it a little easier for scoring if you know you don't want to have to you know type in scores. Um, so uh, so with the assignment tool, also you get the opportunity to allow a retake if you want. So if a student um, cashes in one of their tokens, I can just go into the assignment and allow that student a resubmission. Um, so that's that's one way to, to manage those. Um, and then I've got also on the lessons, I have these little, let me go back. So the course is composed of several elements. So there's assignments. Um, and then there's also these self-reflections. These are um, kind of open-ended inline questions in the, in the lessons tool. And you can grade these if you want. So um, this one, I've answered it as Betty. Um, and I put in a response. And then you can assign a point to that. And it goes to the grade book. So that's one of the items that they would earn throughout the semester. Um, so there, for each unit, there's a little self-reflection. So students can tell me, you know, what, what did I learn? What, you know, what was the takeaway for that particular unit? Um, now, I realize there's not a lot of content in this course, but but you get the idea. Um, there would be an entire unit's worth of content and then there was self-reflection, not just uh, kind of a, a self-reflection out there by itself. Um, and then I've also got some tests and quizzes. And again, 
um, I've set up the scores on these so that they eat the, the max score is one. Um, so you might have to do kind of some um, percents of you know scores if you have multiple questions or if it's just a one question test, then um, you know one point is fine, but I've set them all up so that they're worth one. Um, so that the, my grade book, when I get over here to the grade book, um, everything is is set up that way. And let me just preview as one student so you can get a little bit better idea. Um, so this is Betty's grade book and you can see she's done uh, most of her assignments and um, all of her discussions and one of the reflections. And so, you know, we're still partway through the course, um, but, you know, that way Betty can decide, you know, if she's done enough to earn a B and she's fine with that, you know, she can just kind of stop there. Um, but the, the total of the points, um, she just, all she has to do is compare that to the bundle specifications to figure out if um, if she's earned the grade that she wants for the semester. Um, so anyway, so that's my my specs grading course. Before I move on to ungrading, oh, oh, wait, I'm sorry, I almost left out a really important thing. Um, the grade book, like I said, I kept it super simple um, with kind of a total number of, of items and then a final exam that, that I keyed as sort of a gatekeeper because of the percent that it was worth as a category. Um, but if you wanted to do something more complicated where you have to have two of these and five of those and um, this other project and a satisfactory on, on a field trip or, you know, if it's more complicated than you can easily accomplish in the grade book, there's another tool in Sakai that lets you do a lot of really um, outside of the box sort of grading and that's the postum tool. Um, so the specs grading um, can be enabled by this because what you do is you basically just upload a spreadsheet. You just need to have um, the usernames in there as the first um, item in the spreadsheet. And then uh, the first row needs to have the heading names. But what it does is it makes um, viewable grade sheet, and let me switch over here to student view. Let me, oh, it logged me out. Let me log back in. So if I go in as a student and I go to post them, I'm only gonna see my post them. So it's um, it's like the grade book in that students only get their own stuff, but you can put whatever you want in these um, categories. And the, and the thing is, is that you can export out of Excel. So you can do all kinds of fa fancy, you know, calculations and formulas in Excel to get the grading just the way you want it for your bundles. Um, and then you can upload it here. And also any of these columns don't necessarily just have to be text or numbers, they can be text, they can be feedback columns. Um, so you can just have like, you know, a paragraph of feedback instead of, you know, a number grade if you wanted. Um, so it's very, very flexible. Um, and a lot of people will use Postum as an alternative to the grade book um, it, because it lets you do things a little more easily if you're not kind of following sort of standard grade book process. Um, all right, so were there any questions about the specs grading before I move on? And how am I doing on time? Josh? About 10. Uh, I'm still minutes. muted. Yes, so you're doing pretty well. It's 1058, so you have 12 more minutes. There's okay. one question from Dave Eveland about uh, tokens. So I know we've mm -hmm. moved on a little bit, but uh, since since you've asked, are there limitations to how late a token can be used or would that be explained in the syllabus? You need to spell it out. I mean, the thing about specs grading is you have to be extremely detailed so people know what to expect. But in this particular scenario, I've left it up until, you know, they can use them up until the very end. So if they wanted to trade in a token toward the final, they could. Um, obviously, they have to use them before the end of the course, before, you know, I, I'm going to assign grades, but uh, I don't give a deadline at all because maybe they don't use them and they trade all three tokens in for a pass on the final. All right. Dave follows up saying that in the chat that he knows an instructor who did this. He was intrigued by the idea. 
Um, there are a couple of different approaches. So, um, and Jordan notes that there's an instructor at Pepperdine using Postman for specs grading. Yeah. So they, they're hoping to have a native option in the gradebook in the future. So uh, Yeah, know. we've been looking at some um, improvements. I purposely didn't preview any of those here because they're not real yet, <laughs> but um, but we're working on it. So we're working on, on modifying the gradebook to maybe support some of these use cases a little more natively. So all that's right. all the questions at this moment. So uh, right. you can plow so forward if you move want. On. I'm going to move on to my ungrading course. So my ungrading course um, is basically no grades, <laughs> not the in the final grade because because there has to be a grade to send to the registrar. Um, is I'm going to ask students to self evaluate, give me their rationale why they sh they think they have earned a particular grade. And then if I agree with it, that's the grade that I give them. But I do provide a lot of feedback throughout. So the whole idea is that you do work with the students. You provide feedback at every step. Um, so you don't just turn them loose and, you know, it's, you know, completely hands off. It's very hands on, um, as a matter of fact. But it, it allows that conversation about improving the work to happen more naturally because they're not trying to to game the system to get a certain score. Um, so anyway, so the way I've set this up is I'm also using the assignments tool here. Um, but I've, I've set it up a little bit differently. So I don't know, maybe you're aware or maybe not, but the assignment tool, oh, I'm still in here as a student. Let me switch back over to my faculty. Okay, so the assignment tool will um, actually let you set up assignments that are not uh, numerically scored. So if I go in here to one of these and I choose down here at the bottom, I want to grade it, but I want to choose check mark. So check mark just gives me a, a check that it's been done. It doesn't assign a point. It won't send it to the gradebook, and that's the piece that we're hoping to um, to change so that later it could send it to the gradebook as a just a check, not a number. Um, but right now, just a check mark in the assignment tool. Um, However, it gives you a nice organized place to provide feedback. You can use the Sakai grader. It gives you all of that kind of stuff um, within the assignment tool. So, um, and you have the ability to do those, you know, reallow a submission. So you can send something back if it needs more work um, and kind of go back and forth with students until it gets to a point where, um, you know, that you're happy, you, you think it's a satisfactory um, piece of work and they can move on to the next thing. So I've set up several assignments that way. Um, and these might be drafts of the same project. Maybe they have a capstone project that they work on all semester. And so they start with, you know, maybe the introduction to it and add pieces as they go so that it, it kind of grows. It's an iterative thing that evolves over the course of a semester. And um, usually if you're working on a project like that, I know if I'm working on a project like that, I get really engaged in the project, um, particularly if it's something that's meaningful to me. So so the idea is to, to pick, let students pick something that they want to study, they want to research, want to do a presentation about, um, and uh, they're more likely to actually do the work themselves. Um, and you'll be working with them so much, you get to learn their tone, their, their voice throughout the progression of the semester. So at the end, um, the final grade is basically where students just tell you what they think they did. So I've got um, a, a just a really short response in here that I put in. Um, oh, no submission. I thought I submitted, maybe I didn't. Maybe that was a different demo, sorry. The students would just write you their rationale. And if you agree with that, you can send it to the gradebook. Now, this one I did tie to the gradebook just for simplicity. So it's a little bit easier for me to read a student response over here in the preview area. And then um, if I agree with it, I can just uh, send that directly to the gradebook. Because the only thing I have in the gradebook for this course is the final grade. Um, 
So, uh, so that way I can assess it really easily. Now, one other note that I'll make, I did make pretty good use of the assignment tool here, but another tool that would be really useful in this um, type of ungrading scenario is the Dropbox tool. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Dropbox, if you've used it before, it creates a folder for each student automatically. And um, and the student, let me log back over here. When the student goes in, they only see their own folder and they can upload any kind of file they want to that folder and the faculty member can see it. Um, so if you want to have them work on something where they're submitting lots and lots of drafts of something, the, um, the Dropbox is an alternative way to do it um, because again, you're not assigning grades. Um, so you could do that in here instead of in the assignment tool. Um, and one neat thing about Dropbox is it has this upload to multiple Dropboxes. So if there's something you want to send kind of to the whole class, maybe, um, you know, like a, a rubric that you're going to use or um, let's see here. Yeah. Grades in this course. Yeah. Um, so if I want to send something to everybody, I can do that and I can choose, you know, to send it to all the people or just, you know, a few of them um, and continue. And it'll also send notifications as well. And it puts all those copies in the student folders. Um, so it's a nice way to distribute files if there's something that you want students to work on, like you give them a beginning of something and they have to build it out from there. Um, so anyway, so that's a, a note on the Dropbox is a, a nice tool for an ungrading course. If you've not checked it out, it, it's an option. Um, so Wilma, I just want to note any... it's 11.06 a.m. Yeah. So we're within okay. five minutes. All right, so I'm going to move on to oral exams and then we'll take questions from both just so we don't get bogged down. Um, so my oral exam site, uh, again, is set up to take to do oral exams for grades. So there's no tests, no assignments, everything's done via interview style. Um, but there's two different ways I'm doing it. So um, what I've done in the assignment tool, because there are now um, video assignments in Sakai, students can re record short video clips right in the, the Sakai software without having to have another video recorder. And I've done these weekly check-ins. So each week, um, students would check in and they would record a short video clip telling me what they learned. Um, and so I'm gonna preview this one. And so this was one I was thinking of. Um, so it shows up, well, it should show up for what some, of, some reason it's not loading in my screen. Um, I am doing screen share, so sometimes that creates issues. Anyway, the video would show up here and I could view it, assign a grade for it um, for that week for that student. Um, and then the other thing that I'm doing in here is I'm using the meetings tool. This is an integration with Big Blue Button. Um, the EDF has built a really nice meetings tool that integrates with Microsoft Teams and other, um, you know, things like Zoom and um, Collaborate and other video things will will integrate via LTI or other methods, but I'm just using meetings because it's nicely integrated. Um, and what I've done here, when you when you create a meeting, because it's integrated, you can choose to only have certain people with access to it. So I've assigned basically a room to each student in my course. And um, when the student goes in, they only see their uh, meeting they don't see it so they won't stumble into the wrong room essentially um say they only see their own oral exam meeting room and you could use this once you could use it multiple times depending on how often you want to meet with students but um but it gives you uh, basically a kind of a zoom type experience where you can talk back and forth and see video and what i've done here is i've used the sign up tool to have students schedule their exams. So I used sign up 
so that students can choose what day they want to meet to do their um, you know, exam interview, basically. And then the student would sign up using this tool and it would send them email reminders. I could even put a link to the room in the um, description. And so then it would send email reminders with a link to the meetings tool. So uh, lots of possibilities there as far as keeping people aware of, you know, so they don't miss their exam. Um, okay, so that's all I've got for my three demos, and I think I'm probably out over time. So, are there? No, any you're not. It's 11:09 a.m. So you you ah, it just okay. perfectly. All done. <laughs> um, all right. Chuck notes that uh, the faculty at uh, the University of Michigan School of Information is thinking about oral exams as a way to cope with courses. These are CS courses that become too easy if students lean completely on ChatGPT. I don't know if you want to react to that at all. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a way to, you know, assess an individual student um, where, you know, it's hard to fake, you know, it's hard to fake a video call with someone. Um, so, I mean, ChatGPT doesn't have a deep fake yet, yet <laughs> that can impersonate a person on a video call. So hopefully we won't get there anytime soon. Are, are there equity issues that are challenging when we're dealing with oral exams? Well, I mean, you know, language could be an issue um, if it's a student that where it's not their first language. So, you know, you have to be aware of that. But that's something you encounter in the classroom anyway. So I don't think it's really all that different from a face to face um, classroom situation. It's just sort of taking it to the online venue. Yeah, Josh, uh, for us, as we think about more and more oral exams, that is literally the first question we ask, that you're, you're asking the right question about the equity of oral exams. Um, and we got to work on that. But I think the kinds of things that will help that is making the oral exams more structured. We often think of an oral exam as you got a student at the front of the room and like a panel of 12 teachers shouting things at the student in a very confrontational way. But if you if you make the oral exam something that's got a clear rubric and, you know, you do things like maybe even giving a student, you know, three questions totally in advance of it. And then you like flip a coin and pick one of the three questions and you ask them the question. There are ways to, to the notion that every uh, uh, oral exam needs to be confrontational. I think that's what we've got to fix. So that, that, because right. we ask the same question, Josh, as soon as like, oh, oral exams, that's going to solve everything. Oh, wait a sec. That's going to mess everything up. So then you got to start solving <laughs> that stuff. Yeah. And that's actually why I added the assignments with the weekly check-ins as sort of a low pressure kind of assignment because students can record it whenever they want and you give them the question in the assignment, but they can take their time to answer it. So it's a little less pressure to kind of gear them up for a, a face to or real time, at least uh, discussion. All right, it is 11, 12 a.m. So we're, we've moved about two minutes into our break, um, but I think this is this is really important to, you know, to have a few extra minutes on. So, uh, so it's 12 minutes past the hour, wherever you are, 11, 12 a.m. Eastern. Our next session will be on group awareness with Christina Schweibert starting at 11, 20 a.m. Eastern, 20 minutes past the top of the hour. So uh, grab a quick break. You've got about, uh, you, now, you now have seven minutes before that session, and we will see you back here in just a few minutes. Thanks, all. Thanks, everybody.